And to speak about that, we have the star of another kingdom, the heartthrob, a man who's become a heartthrob internationally around the world for his reading, his performance of another kingdom, Michael Knowles, who spent the weekend in a much, much different way. How you doing? I'm doing great, and <laughs> I can't believe it. It's sort of a, a sad moment right now because the last acting job that I'll ever have <laughs> has now come to a close <laughs> on Another Kingdom. It's true, it's true, and you were, you were great. And everybody said, I mean, there are now 1,800 five-star ratings on the thing. It, it gets incredible reviews, and some of them actually mentioned that it was the only good thing you've ever done. <laughs> yeah. which, <laughs> it is actually really nice as an actor because I've, I have done like a million little projects on TV and indie films and stuff that nobody's ever going to see because we have no creative control over it. Right. A lot of these projects go through the Hollywood uh, system, so there are all these this crazy leftism, these patina, uh, this patina of leftism that goes over it, and it just, I don't know, it doesn't make the projects as enjoyable. This one, we said uh, two words to Hollywood, which were not happy birthday, <laughs> and we did it ourselves, and you write, wrote it, and nobody was able to tell you, take this out, that's not politically correct, no, yep. no, you can't do this. We put it out there, and then it got a ton of attention, and as you said, a lot of five-star reviews, and I love it. And I don't care if Hollywood doesn't uh, want to take on conservatives and doesn't want to greenlight conservative projects, even if they're popular, because we can just keep doing it ourselves. I know. I mean, I, I start today thinking about how we can bring us afford to bring a second season, because the sound guys, Mathis and his team, were so great, yeah. and they worked for so little, and they worked so hard uh, that I, I don't know how. We can't ask them to do that again, because first of all, they'll beat me up. Right. And so, <laughs> uh, but, but we will figure it out, and we'll try and bring a second season uh, come the fall. So. <laughs> Talk about this. You, you're getting married to the yes. sweet little Alyssa. Alyssa. Is it sweet? It's, I can always, you always change it. Is it sweet little Alyssa or sweet little Alyssa? Uh, well, you know, as I learned from Genesis 3, that's yeah. my dominion. I can change her name at will. <laughs> I, this is my family, you know. Uh, no, her name is Alyssa. I, I exclusively refer to her as sweet little Alyssa. I see. And, uh, you know, so I... <laughs> Okay. So I'll, I'll very often I'll explain, you know, I'll wake up in the morning and just say, Mac, you should do your show like this today. <laughs> do, 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 do. And she'll say, you, you know, I don't sound like that. <laughs> but look, this is my family. I'm going to construct it how I want, darn it. And yes, we went to marriage class this weekend. And you, and you went to marriage class. Now, sweet little Elisa is, in fact, Jewish. as or uh, Jewish. 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 Not mm -hmm. the whole thing, yeah. Right. Uh, but, but you are having a Catholic marriage, and you have to take a class to do this. Is that right? That's exactly right. Right. So okay. you go, uh, the Catholic Church is pretty open about this. As long as you're going to raise the kids Catholic, uh, you, don't, you don't need to be baptized or anything for a wedding. If you get baptized, you're supposed to do it for the Jesus, as a matter of fact. Uh -huh. So uh, they're very open, but one, there are a few requirements that you have to do before you get married in a Catholic Church. One of them is take a class called pre cana And I was sort of dreading it. I felt it would be probably cornball, and they would just tell you, to never use condoms and have a million children as right. the Catholics are wont to do. But it was wonderful. It was a great experience. Huh. The people who ran the show uh, were, themselves had, a, had been married and had a ton of marital problems. And they went to one of these, the, the Catholic version for already married couples, and it totally transformed their marriage. And I think everybody, regardless of their faith, wow. could benefit from this. So these are the people teaching it had mm -hmm. had problems in their marriage. A lot of problems. They were okay. on the brink of divorce, wow. and they weren't really going to church. I don't. I think the wife herself wasn't Catholic, and that's why I, I really this this could be quite an ecumenical experience, at, because everything that's taught here is so common sense. It's not like it comes out of some deep. Uh, you know, you, you need to have a PhD in Christology in order to understand it. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like common sense. But these days, with the women's marches and the and the pink hats and the screaming, common sense isn't very common. So I, I do think I learned much more about uh, equality of the sexes and the relationship between the sexes at Catholic marriage class than huh. I ever could have at, at the Women's March. And a lot of the Catholic marriage class is just scraping away the insidious ideology of feminism. And it really makes you, th especially when you look at the Women's March, you see feminism as this totally perverse and self-defeating ideology that, you know, they say, people like Aziz Ansari say, feminism just means you think men and women are equal. You think, well, that's a funny name to pick then, isn't it? It's a strange <laughs> name. There is an, a, an ideology for that. It's called egalitarianism. Right. But what feminism does is it, uh, it, it forces women, as you frequently say, 
to take on all of these male sensibilities right. and these masculine views of the world that they could never live up to. So one great example, particularly pertaining to marriage, is the hookup culture. The hookup culture says, and because feminism says this, that men and women view sex exactly the same way. We're just all going out there to have fun. Casual sex is great. Men and women both love it. And it, it, this is really awful on two counts because it convinces women that they should want casual sex and if they are unfulfilled by that there's something wrong with them and it convinces men that women want casual sex and so you can treat them as disposable yep. and what does that leave you it leaves you women who are who de delude themselves on the one hand and are, are utterly used by men who do have a rapacious appetite yeah. for, for sex in a way that women do not and and the catholic church to their credit, has been arguing this for many, many years, mm -hmm. even, and with birth control, they say that it contributes to this, and they predicted it was going to happen, and their predictions came true. That's, no that's exactly it. right, and so there were some takeaways from this. I thought they would talk about what's called natural family planning, uh -huh. which is uh, yeah. colloquially <laughs> referred to as pull and pray, and uh, there, it's a little more uh, sophisticated than that. Yeah. It has something like a 98 to 99% uh, uh, working rate as long as you do it correctly yeah and but it wasn't really that the one thing they did say is that when you enter into marriage for it to be sacramental you can't close yourself off to the possibility of children you can huh. say maybe i don't want children right now maybe i'd prefer to not have a dozen children but to close yourself off entirely stops that marriage from being a marriage it it invalidates it and wow. uh, they drew uh, they drew this uh, interesting dichotomy between civil marriage which is a contract it's what most people engage in and sacramental marriage which is a vow before god and one big difference here is that civil marriage you don't need to be open to children. You can say, I don't want to have any children. Uh, you can dissolve it whenever you want because it's a contract and either party is perfectly free to dissolve it. Sacramental marriage is not that way because you make a fool of God. You make a promise to God yeah. that you will uh, love and cherish this person f uh, until the end of time. Yeah. And uh, an image that they drew, which I feared would be corny, but I think is quite illuminating, is that of an e equilateral triangle with God at the top and the husband on one side and the wife on the other. And their idea is that if your marriage is centered around something real and permanent and eternal and outside of time and space, such as, say, the creator of time and space, then as, if the husband gets closer to God, he will become closer to his wife and vice versa. If the husband gets closer to his wife or vice versa, they will get closer to God because uh, their this triangle is always equilateral. The triangle yeah. is always equilateral. Good. And Good. To, to hear the testimony of even just the couple who ran it, that seems uh, so clear. And when one thinks about difficult marriages or failed marriages that you've seen on your own, there is always, uh, there does seem to be that lack of grounding it in something outside of the two of you. You wrote about it beautifully in uh, The Great Good Thing, no. about there, there was you and there's your wife, and then there's th this thing that's separate from you and your wife. It's, uh, not only separate, but but somehow better. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a, it's a very strange thing. I mean, you know, I I, I always I'm, I mean, you you know, Ellen, my wife, she is an, a spectacular human being, and she's one of the nicest human beings I've ever N I've ever met. Knowing you, one would um, <laughs> just know this intuitively, but she is an angel uh, <laughs> yeah, walking the face is. of the earth. She is, but but we're all flawed people, and I'm flawed, and she's flawed, and yet the marriage seems to be something that actually has the capability of healing us. Uh, in in within itself of making us better within itself and certainly certainly my experience of the possibility of actual love in the world was part of what led me to God was part of what led me to believe well well I would start to think to myself well look if I recognized love when I saw it and I was right and I see God maybe I'm not crazy maybe mm -hmm. to just say to me I'm having an illusion I'm having a delusion doesn't make any sense because I've been crazy I know what that's like and I've been sane and when you start to say that when you start to realize that the internal experience of love can be real and lasting then you start to realize that you are capable of perceiving things that are not visible to the naked eye that that's right and and that um, that the realness of that the tangibility of that uh, seeing it so vis uh, feeling it so viscerally, I, I think that this gets to the difference between sacramental marriage and whatever mm. passes for marriage today. 
I think gets to the essential criticism of the left, which is that the left wants the appearance of the thing without the essence of the thing. So they want a university degree, but they don't want a liberal education. They eat vegan bacon, you know, they want meatless <laughs> hamburgers or whatever. They, they drink uh, decaffeinated coffee and they want what looks like a marriage on, this, on the outside without the thing that makes the marriage itself. And you observe this all, especially now, planning out the wedding. Uh, everything is so, so expensive. And uh, over time, weddings seem to have become much more elaborate and much more expensive. I've been to a number that have been absurdly extravagant. And I wonder if the reason that the wedding uh, ceremony itself is so extravagant is because the seriousness with which we view the marriage has become less important. I, I think that is absolutely true. My sister, uh, Caitlin Flanagan, wrote about that at The Atlantic many, many years ago, uh, that uh, it, you know, it's, it, when you start to propose and you have to have a plane going overhead mm -hmm. and you're in a stadium and it's on the jumbotron and all this stuff, you start to think like, well, maybe this doesn't have a whole lot of meaning. You know, maybe, maybe all I have to do is ask, you know, maybe uh, that's not what it's about. Maybe it's not about the ceremony itself and these marriages, these weddings that cost you bankrupt people. They send you into debt. Obviously, you want to have a nice party. It's a big day and the, it means a lot, especially to the bride, I think. But still, but still, you know, it, it gets so outlandish that you start to think there's an emptiness at the heart of it. No question about it. I'm interested to hear that that part of the sacrament is the willingness to have children. I did not know that. Um, I, obviously, I know that the churches were the things that they said where you thought like, no, I can't go there. Not at all. There, there really wasn't at all. I thought the whole thing would be some person hectoring us about how we need to start having children immediately and keep popping them out. It wasn't that, but that focus on the openness to children is about saying yes to life. It's about mm. saying, yes, I accept you. I don't merely want my own gratification, be it sexually or professionally or personally or whatever, emotionally, but I, I want to give life. I want, uh, you know, mm. uh, God is, says uh, many things in an obscure fashion in Scripture, but he says one thing, at least, very clearly, which is be fruitful and multiply. Go, uh, keep having children. Be, you know, go out and give yourselves to children. And uh, that, hmm. that openness makes perfect sense to me because there, there has to be a, a purpose to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, so, so much true. of the prevailing postmodern culture is nihilistic is just, well, we're just here, and what if it feels good, do it, man, yeah. and we're going to have a nice su sum of experiences, and then we turn into worm food. And so it's no surprise that in that culture, divorce would uh, flourish. Yeah. But in a culture that believes that there is a purpose to marriage, a, a central purpose of which is the openness to c creating life and giving love and life, it, it seem, makes perfect sense to me that those couples would divorce at much lower rates. I asked someone once, uh, who had a, a friend of mine who had, has had a long marriage. I said, how have you had such a long marriage? He said, well, the secret is don't get divorced. <laughs> and <they're, laughs> yeah, and that is a, a big part of this. Yeah. In, the, in a civil marriage where uh, the two parties enter into it without having a sense of what they're doing, what they're doing together, what they want to do together, what the purpose is of their bodies and of their love and of their minds, uh, it, it's easier to just fall away when things go a little hard. Yeah. But if you preclude even the possibility of divorce because you don't want to make a fool of God, uh, it it's, seems much more reasonable that those couples would stay together and that th their love would grow. No, no question about it. You know, he hearing you talk, I almost want to stop writing to Alyssa, telling her to get out <laughs> to while run, there's still yeah. time. Uh, but I'll think about it. I was going <laughs> to ask her uh, what she felt about the pre cana ceremony, but obviously I had tape over her mouth and she yeah, was course, chained up because I didn't, I didn't want it. <laughs> so I didn't want her to say some things. And yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't want to listen to their opinions. Yeah. The Michael Knowles <laughs> show is coming. I'm out of time, but the Michael Knowles show is coming up next. We'll be talking about the women's marches and why everything they say is wrong. Everything is a lie, point <laughs> by point. All right, Knowles, great to see you. Good I'll to talk see you. Soon. Soon. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the the thing about the body, the thing about the flesh, is it's very there. It is very there. It is very easy to believe in. But that's true of words, too. But words refer to something that is not there, but is just as real. And the flesh refers to something that is not there, that is just as real, which is the spirit. And you have to focus on that to keep its reality in mind. You have to have faith, and you have to have focus to keep its reality in mind. And that is what makes marriages better. Let's